Um, you might know that a year ago, baby Hope Addison was born. She was born early. She was born with significant uh, health problems. And so we're thankful to God that after a year, it's her birthday today, Hope is in the back, and she weighs 11 pounds, and she is happy and well. She's way back there. Just, Tiffany, we stand up and hold her. Woohoo! <laughs> Praise God. Oh. Oh, and someday, baby Hope, you will be, oh, she's waving. I love it. Someday, baby Hope, you will be sitting on this step, and I will be asking you very difficult questions, too. <laughs> and it will be lots of fun. <laughs> very good. Hey, well, we are in our final um, sermon in our series about the prophet Elijah. And so if you have a Bible, go ahead and find the book of 2 Kings. We'll be in chapter 2 for most of the message. You can find a Bible underneath your seat if you don't have one, or if you would rather just watch, the text will be on the screen throughout the sermon too. But before we get going into our text, I want to set up the main question that I would like us to consider together. And here it is. Sorry. <laughs> Very dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> I just realized how warm a jacket is. There, we'll put that there. Okay, here we go. Now I can be free. Here's the question. When you think about your life, were you called into this world? Or do you believe that you have been thrown into this world? Let me put it another way. Do you believe that you were brought into this world for a purpose, for a life with meaning? Or do you believe that you're simply the product of two cells that came together and because those cells found themselves, here you are in this world? What is it that you believe in your deepest being? Because how you answer this question and what you believe to be true about that question, I think, will profoundly shape your life. It will affect how you experience this life as well. So today, as we wrestle with that question, we're going to look at a new character today, and his name is Elisha. Okay, can you say Elisha? Sha. We've been talking about Elijah. So don't get confused because I probably will during this message. But the reason I want to look at Elisha is because in our text, Elijah, oh man, is at the end of his life. And he's preparing to pass on his calling and his story to his successor, who will be Elisha, who God has called to be the next great prophet over Israel. Now, in our text that we'll look at in 2 Kings chapter 2, we find ourselves at the very moment when Elisha is preparing to step into his calling as prophet. But before we get to this point, I should have had you turn to a different text. <laughs> Put your finger in 2 Kings chapter 2, and we're going to look at the original story in Scripture when Elisha is originally called. So put your finger in 2 Kings chapter 2 and page back to 1 Kings 19. And if that's too hard, have no fear. Here it is. 1 Kings 19, 19 through 20. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elijah then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? Okay. So one day, Elisha is going about normal, a normal day for him. He's out in the field. He is plowing his fields. And the text makes a point to tell us that he's plowing the field with not one yoke of oxen, which would have been very common, not two yoke of oxen, but Elisha is plowing his field with 12 yoke of oxen. This means that Elisha owns 24 oxen. 
which is not what a normal family in the Middle East would have had at that time. In other words, what the text is telling us is that Elisha is a very wealthy farmer. Elisha has all really that the world could offer him in his region. If you remember a couple weeks ago when we talked about the if only I had this syndrome, here's the thing. People are looking at Elisha and people in his community are saying, if only I had what Elisha had, okay? So that's what we're talking about this morning in terms of who Elisha is and what he has. He's a very comfortable guy and life is going well for him. But then in the distance, a man with a cloak of camel hair and a leather belt shows up, and he comes to Elisha, and this man takes off this cloak. He puts it around Elisha, and then he walks away and leaves Elisha with the cloak of hair. I want to think for a moment about what did this act mean for Elisha? What is the significance of this? If you've been with us, you have learned that Elijah had a very special look about himself. He was known by the entire community, all of Israel, as the prophet who was dressed in hair, who wore a leather belt. Now, The scriptures do not tell us how often Elijah washed his cloak. The scriptures don't tell us if the cloak wore out and he had to go kill an animal and make a new one. I'm not sure. But my guess is, this is my guess, my guess is, is that Elijah wore that same cloak of hair throughout his entire life. Could be wrong, but even if he didn't, I know that he made one just like his previous one. It was his thing. So Elijah takes this cloak and he puts it around Elisha. I don't know if I said that right. Elijah puts it around Elisha. Now think about where this cloak has been, okay? For starters, just so you can start to visualize This cloak is nothing like my cloak that I was just wearing. This is cleaned, and there's not many wrinkles in it. It's been hanging up in my closet for a couple years since I've worn it last. And, uh, but Elijah's cloak, man, he just came from three years of hiding and running and living in the wilderness. So for starters, this cloak is pretty dirty, and I think it's pretty gross. But think about all the places that this cloak has been. When Elijah, for the first time, went to the king of Israel, remember King Ahab, the evil king who worshiped false gods? King, he goes up to King Ahab wearing the cloak, and in his cloak he declared to King Ahab, your gods that you follow are phonies. The true God is the God of Israel, right? Um, by the way, in that incident almost got him killed, right? Because King Ahab went to go kill Elijah. So Elijah wears this cloak. He goes and he hides in the wilderness for three years. So this cloak has gone out to the wilderness. Later, um, Elijah shows back up. And remember uh, the story at Mount Carmel, right? There's, a, there's two altars. There's the prophets of Baal. Then there's the one prophet of Yahweh. And of course, Uh, Elijah the prophet in his cloak just says Lord of heaven would you send fire to this altar and show the world that you're God and fire comes down from heaven but of course King Ahab wants to kill him again right so with this cloak he tucks the cloak into his belt and he runs off again until he gets to the holy mountain where he wants to meet God If you go back to that story, you'll find the cloak again because when he meets God and God begins to speak, Elijah in his fear pulls his cloak over his face as he goes to meet God. You see, this cloak is like so much a part of Elijah's identity. It's been with him. And when he puts this cloak on Elisha, He's saying, Elisha, you're the one who's going to fill my shoes. Or perhaps, you're the one who's going to fill my cloak. You are going to continue everything that God has done in me, and you will carry on that 
work. And what does Elisha say? Elisha say, he says, yes, I will do it. But before he does it, Elisha says, listen, I want to go back and at least say goodbye to my family. Did you see the response, though? Look at this response. It's kind of interesting. I want to hit on this for a second. Um, Go back, Elijah replied. And then this bizarre line, right? What have I done to you? What is Elijah saying here? This is Elijah's way of saying, listen, if you want to go back to your family and say goodbye, don't talk to me about it. I have done nothing for you. You have to understand that this is God Almighty who has called you into this role. Your job isn't to be faithful to me. Your job is to be faithful to God. And if you think God wants you to go back and say goodbye, then go back. I haven't done anything to you. It is God who has done it for you. Which I think, of course, there's a wonderful little message there about calling, isn't there? So often, I think, as we grow up in this world, there's so much pressure, whether from family or friends, to be somebody or to do something. But none of that matters unless God wants you to do it. So Elisha says yes, and let's see what happens next. So Elisha left Elijah and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them. That's 24 oxen. It's a lot of blood, a lot of meat. He burned the plowing equipment. And remember, this is huge plowing equipment if it took 24 oxen to carry it. So he, uh, so he burned the plowing equipment uh, to cook the meat, and he gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and to become his servant. It's a fascinating scene. What is Elisha doing here? Well, I think there's two things that are going on here in the text. The first is this. When Elisha slaughters the oxen, when he burns his plowing equipment, what is he saying? He's saying, what Elijah is offering me, or what God is offering me through Elijah, far outweighs this comfortable life I have. And I'm going to slaughter my oxen. I'm going to burn the plow. Why? Because Elisha is saying, there's no going back. I am on a new trajectory. I have a new plan and I have a new purpose. But there's also a second thing that I think is happening. When you read the commentators and the really smart people who write about the Bible, what a lot of them believe is that Elisha is throwing a grand party for his community. I mean, here, you have 24 oxen. You have huge bonfires. And so it's believed that Elisha says, listen, he is so joyful. He is so happy that he has discovered his purpose in life. That he's saying, let's have a party. And so he does it. Because he's discovered that there's nothing better. There's nothing more meaningful in life than having a purpose that comes from God. It is so important to Elisha that he makes this extraordinary trade, doesn't he? Here's the thing. The life of Elijah is known. Elijah, filled with the Spirit of God, did not have a comfortable life, right? He lived in hiding. He lived on the run, He lived without food sometimes. He was hated and hunted. But Elisha says, but Elisha says, but Elijah was filled with the Spirit of God. And I will trade everything that I have to go after Elijah. Because when you compare this world and what it has to offer versus following God and being in his will and his calling, there is no comparison. Amen. Let's go on. Okay. This is our main text for today. So if you have your Bible, 2 Kings chapter 2. 
This text comes after 18 years of the relationship that Elijah and Elisha had. Elijah has spent the last 18 years cleaning Elijah's feet, cooking his food, doing his laundry maybe. And this is the text though where God says, Elisha, now it's time to step into your call. So let's read what happens. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elijah said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. That wasn't even supposed to be funny. <laughs> Apparently it was. Then Elijah said to them, it's going to happen again, watch this. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know, what the Lord is, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak, he rolled it up, and he struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. It's a very interesting story, isn't it? I think there's a few things happening here. First of all is this. Um, for Elijah, God is leading Elijah through this series of visits for these different towns and regions in Israel. And at each of these regions, there is a school or a company of prophets. Um, it's believed that those prophets were probably... Um, came from way back from a man named Samuel, but these prophets are in their prophet school, and they're learning about the Lord, they're learning how to be faithful, and Elijah's kind of the one over all of that. Now, he's the head prophet, and so Elijah's visiting the schools, and he's simply saying, hey, I'm leaving, but do not lose hope. Keep carrying on with what you're supposed to be doing, and so there's an encouragement from Elijah, but for Elisha, I think there's a kind of test that's going on for him in this reason, or in this story, right? Every site, this is interesting, the sites that are chosen that God sends them to represent the first sites that Israel visited when they went into the promised land. Basically, God sent them and retraced the steps of Israel into the land flowing of milk and honey, now, why would God do this? I think for Elisha, God has a message here for him. A teaching moment. God is saying, listen, Elisha, you know I've called you. I called you 18 years ago. You have a cloak that you're supposed to fill and to carry on the work. But Elisha, you must understand that the work I am calling you to is not just the work of your lifetime. This is a work that began before you were born. It is a work that is going to go on and on and on. Because God wants him to know, Elisha, yes, you have a purpose, but you need to remember this life is not about you. And sometimes you will not understand my purpose because you cannot see the bigger story. But Elisha, I want you to be faithful. I want you to keep following step by step. And I will lead you in your purpose, right? And then there's a chance actually for Elisha to bow out, right? I mean, at every place they visit, Elijah gives them a little test. Elisha, are you ready to stop? You can wait here if you want. But Elisha says, no, I'm going to keep going. 
And eventually, it gets them to the final moment. And I think this is the final test for Elisha. And it's my favorite part of the text by far. You may know this. Here we go. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked for a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, my spirit will be yours. Otherwise, if you do not see me, it will not. You know, like I said, I have always loved, loved this moment in Scripture because you get a glimpse into what Elisha wants above all else. Now, when I first read the Bible the first time and I saw the Scripture, I thought, and this is pretty cool, that Elisha was asking for a double portion in the sense of two times what Elijah had, which is pretty awesome, but that's not quite what he's asking for. The double portion inheritance in Israel represented the primary inheritance that the elder son would receive in the estate from his parents because it's the elder son who would carry on the family farm and the family business and lead the family. And so when Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit, he's saying, I, as I have been called, I want to be like the elder brother, the father prophet who carries on your work and leads your work. And he also knows that if I'm going to do this, Elijah, there's no way I can possibly, possibly do this unless I have your spirit as well. This, of course, brings up the question that I brought to my kids last night in prayer time, that I brought to the kids this morning. Um, there we go. What is it, think about this in your life, what is it that you want above all else? If you could write down your greatest desire, what would you write? Last night, I was hoping my boys would share, but they got shy, and I understand. So I'll tell you what they told me last night. I won't tell you which one it was. You might guess, but I had two profoundly different answers. It was very funny. Um, one of my boys, I prayed with him, and uh, what would you like, son? And he goes, if you could have anything in the world, he goes, I want to live in space and have a space board. And apparently a space board is like a skateboard that you can ride around in space. So that's what one of my kids wanted. And that was cool. Um, the other one, also super cute, the other one I said, what, what is it, son, that you would ask for? You could ask for anything in the entire world. And he says, well, my wish would be that everybody in the world got one wish. Isn't that sweet? Heart of gold he has. Back to the story. That was kind of a tangent, but... Um, what would you wish for? Seriously, in your heart of hearts, would you wish and hope for some type of material possession? Perhaps you would wish that you won the lottery. I guess the lottery was pretty big a couple weeks ago. When I was a kid, I wanted to have my own private island. Would you wish for a private island? Probably not. Perhaps there's a relationship in your life, family member, a friend, or even a relationship with God, and your wish is that that relationship could be reconciled. Perhaps, and this is what a lot of children do, perhaps do you wish that you had some kind of power, that you were super strong, or perhaps that you were the world's best basketball player so you could be rich and famous. Perhaps you would want a superpower, like having a space board and flying around in space. Perhaps, like Solomon, you would ask for wisdom. Perhaps you would ask that you could be all-knowing, maybe even like God. Maybe 
you would ask that God's kingdom would hurry up and come. Maybe you would ask God, maybe your wish would be that you could see God face to face and live, and you could know him personally. Maybe your wish would simply be that you could see God. Whatever your answer is to that question, I think is a wonderful indication about what you believe will bring you the most joy and the most satisfaction in your life. What does Elisha ask for? He asks for a double portion of God's spirit. Elisha is saying, the one thing that will satisfy me, the one thing that will fill me, is that I could walk with God and know God and carry out his will and his purpose for my life on this earth, right? And he gave up everything for it. And I have a feeling if we got to go back and ask Elisha, listen, Elisha, was it worth it? Was it worth it leaving your 24 oxen and your comfortable life to follow a crazy life where you too would be persecuted and chased? Was it worth it? Elijah would look at you and he would say, it was worth every single minute. So does Elisha get the blessing? I think that's probably a question that you already know, but here we go, because it's a fun scene to read. As they were talking, or as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and he tore it in two. And then he picked up that cloak that he had put on 18 years ago. And he stood at the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. And in that moment, Elisha knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he had received what he asked for from the Lord. And not only did he know it, but all the other prophets knew it too. The Lord's spirit had rested on Elisha. That's cool, isn't it? God is a generous God. He loves all of his children, and he desires to pass on his blessing to each of them. And he does so with Elisha. You see, before Elisha was even born, God had a plan for him. The thing I love about saying that, though, is that when we look at the scriptures and we look at what God has spoken to us, we very quickly learn that Elisha is not simply a single person who has this special plan, but yet every last person that God created has been created for a purpose and has been created to be a part of God's plan. This is one great scripture in the book of Psalms when the psalmist is writing and he's reflecting on his life. He says, God, even when I was in my mother's womb, you knit me together. You formed and you shaped me. I was no accident. God creates with a purpose. There's one other text in the book of Ephesians chapter one. Love that text. And God talks about how he has a plan for his children that literally began before the foundations of the world were laid. So what is this grand plan that God has for each of us? Many faithful believers, as they have wrestled with Scripture, have tried to write about the grand plan of God. 
And when you look at many of these, you pretty much find that they're saying the same thing. A man named St. Augustine from way, 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 way back, he wrote this. I love this. Thou was old language, so you have to turn on your King James language hearing device. Thou has made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find, find rest in thee. Let me translate into modern day English. St. Augustine is saying, listen, God has created us to know him, and we are not complete until we're in a relationship with God. Another group of writers in the Heidelberg Catechism, this came from my days in Michigan in the Reformed Church, said that the chief end of humanity, our final great purpose, is to glorify God, which means to make God known for who he is, and I love this, this is freeing, and enjoy God forever. Our final purpose is to know God and enjoy the relationship that he's given us. Did you catch that text at the beginning of our worship service that we read? Isaiah 55, the writer writes, Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread? And your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. God says over and over in scripture, he says, listen, friends, I am the source of all that is good. I will fulfill your deepest needs, come to me. Even Jesus then, when he'd walk this earth, he would say, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the water of life, I am living water, I am the one who will satisfy you. So what is the ultimate purpose of our lives? Our ultimate purpose is to know God. That's what he wants, and that's what he created each of us for. It's incredibly beautiful. A man named C.S. Lewis, when he was reflecting on life and life purpose, he said it this way. This is pretty cool. He said, listen, when you look at our grand purpose, you have to think about your purpose as an end goal in life. He said, this life is a journey, but it's taking us to the moment that we've been created for. It's taking us to the moment when we will know God fully and know him face to face. And then, well, I don't know if he said this or someone else said it, or maybe I just thought it. It's kind of like going to Disneyland, right? The journey to Disneyland can be a great journey, it's beautiful. You can spend time with your family and your kids unless they're fighting, which is normal when we go places. <laughs> Looking at my wife to see what she's saying. She's laughing. But even our journey to Disneyland, right? We enjoy the ride because we're with each other. But ultimately, we're going to get to that moment when we get to Disneyland together. And what is it that makes Disneyland so great? I'll tell you what, it'd be really sad if I forgot my four children and got there without them, right? I've only forgotten one child one time. It's pretty good, huh? Um, but Disneyland is great when all of our friends and all of our family are there. You see, in the meantime, as we prepare for the grand purpose of our lives to know God, Jesus gave us an earthly purpose he says, I want you to live in such a way where you can get as many people as you can to Disneyland. <laughs> heaven, <laughs> not Disneyland. Disneyland's nothing compared to heaven. I promise you that, okay? And Jesus said, listen, while you're on this earth, you are to be a light to the world. That is your purpose. As you love this world, you will discover your purpose in this world. Your job is to be a witness and to testify about my love. Because why is it that we get to be in heaven face to face with God someday? It has nothing to do with our goodness and our good works because we don't have it in us. We could never earn our way into heaven, right? But Jesus Christ took all of our sin. He nailed it to a cross. So when he could say, listen, whoever believes in me shall not perish, but they will have eternal life. And his offer is for new life. 
And in the same way that Elisha receives the spirit of Elijah, the promise of Scripture is that when we believe, we too would be filled with the Spirit of God, and that Spirit will give you everything that you need to carry out God's purpose in your life. Now, sometimes in our lives, we will discover specific purposes, and we will find causes or things or ministries that God has called us to. But if you're like me, there's been a lot of my life where I haven't really known the specific thing that God has asked me to do. But I do know this, is that if I take it day by day, and I love the people that God has put in my path, not just my friends and family, but if I could learn to love my enemies, if I could love the way that Jesus loves, if I do that, then I will find my purpose. If you're lost right now, I promise you this, if you would learn to love the way that Jesus loves, he will direct you for the purpose that he has called you into this world. So with that, my brothers and sisters, let's pray. Father in heaven, you are good, you are gracious, you are the source of anything that is good. You are the only one who can truly satisfy and you have created us to know you. Thank you, God, that you don't make it hard to find you. Thank you that you don't make us jump through a bunch of religious hoops to try to earn your favor. You simply say, come to me, because my work on the cross is enough. Friends here this morning, if you have not come to know the true one who gives life. I urge you, come to him because your life will not be the same. He is worth it. And all of my other friends who are here who've already responded to Jesus and you walk with him and you're filled with the spirit, Lord, help us not to let the things of this world and the desires of this world get in the way and cloud us from the grand purpose that you have given us because nothing compares to walking with you and knowing you in this life. Spirit of God, give us courage, give us faith to walk forward this day in your plans. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.